Okay, the next section here is the fair housing section. We are going to actually do a whole chapter on this, but here's a quick introduction. Understand that there are seven protected classes in the federal fair housing law, seven of them. Now, every state has the ability to adopt federal laws or they can make it more stringent. They cannot make it less than what the feds say. Most states have adopted the seven protected classes. You are not allowed to use any of these in the decision to buy, sell these trade exchange uh, consult because of a person's race, their color, their religion, their national origin, disability, familial status, family status, or the disability. Those are the seven federal protected classes. We will do a whole chapter dealing with what these are, okay? But understand, you cannot use these. You can't say, I'm not going to sell to you because you're a Martian. <clears throat> that could be a race, and we're, you can't do that. I'm not going to sell to you because of too many children. That's a, a familial issue, all right? So understand, Washington State, for example, has added three more. Single parent, military status, and public assistance. So a state can add, but they can't subtract. Most states cut and paste. Most states use just the seven. Indiana is a cut and paste state. We use the actual federal law. So in Indiana, there's only seven protected classes. Now, the real estate market is an imperfect market. And what I mean by that is that you can have three people look at the exact same property and give three different values because there are a lot of factors that affect that market. And a market is nothing more than where you take something to buy and sell, like the farmer's market. People buy and sell fruits and vegetables or plants. The real estate market is the market in which real property is bought and sold. It is imperfect. Do we have a perfect market? Yes, we do. It's called the stock market. At any given moment, everybody in the world is paying the exact same thing. Now, that could change in five seconds, so don't get that confused. But at that given moment, everybody pays, pays the exact same thing for a share of uh, Chrysler or GM or whatever. Now, two minutes later, they could be paying something else because it's a distinct, it's separate. But understand at that given time, whereas in the real estate market at that given moment, three people go, my mom lives across the street. That property has more value because I want to be close to her. Or somebody's going to say, well, that house is in a different school system. I don't want my kids to uh, <clears throat> change school systems. So I, I, I don't like that house at all. That is the problem that you guys will deal with this whole imperfect thing. The most common force that drives this is supply and demand. Supply and demand. And supply and demand is usually controlled or dominated or created, however you want to look at, by two major issues. These two. Now, they mention a third one here, but uh, to me, number three is very innocuous, meaning it very seldom happens. A property's uniqueness will drive supply and demand. Think about a property that is sitting on Geist Reservoir in Indiana or Conroe Lake in Texas. Uh, everybody wants to be on a lake. Therefore, it is very unique. It will affect the price. There are only 372 lots that sit on Geist. When one of those go for sale, it never goes at a discount because it's very unique and the demand is always high, okay? Immobility, you cannot move real property. 
I don't care what you say. I can dig a hole in it. Yeah, but then you own the hole. You cannot move that property. I have had several investors in my career that said that are looking at a property and go, I like that property. If it were sitting on this side of the road, I would buy the property. Well, it's not. Okay. So uniqueness and immobility will drive this supply and demand. Let's go over here and talk about supply and demand for a minute. If we were live in class, this is where I usually pick on the youngest person because they were the closest to high school. There is a very special term when supply equals demand. This term is not in your book. Write it down in notes. Write it on the uh, outline. What is it called when supply equals demand? The word is equilibrium. It is also a mythical state. We never reach equilibrium. And what we're trying to always do is balance this teeter-totter to get to equilibrium, but we can't. So let's visit some things here real quick. I had demand the same. Meaning I kept the demand for a product the same. But the supply of that product went up. What happens to the price? Anybody know? If I had 10 apples and there were five people that wanted those apples, and now I have 20 apples, the supply has gone up and the demand has stayed the same, what happens to the price of those apples? They go down. All right. So holding demand the same, when supply goes up, the prices go down. Conversely, let's look at the other side. If we keep supply the same and demand goes up, what happens to the price? It too goes up. Now these work counterintuitively as well. If demand goes down, price goes down. So this, my friends, is the seller's market and the buyer's market. Which one do you want to work in? You have got the seller's market and the buyer's market. <clears throat> Which one do we, as working professionals, don't answer this question if you're selling a home. If you're selling your own home, you may want to pick one or the other. But if you are working in the professional world, which market do we work in? Do we work in the seller's market or the buyer's market? I want you to hit pause, think about it, and come back and tell me which one of these two markets you actually want to be in. All right? Hit the pause. Okay, now you're back. So it's a trick question. Which one do you want to be working in? The answer is... You're going to work in both of them. You just need to know which one you're in because it will affect the method by which you work. Years ago in the 2006 time frame, let's use that one. If you had a pulse, you could get a loan. So whenever a buyer called us and said, hey, I want to buy, you were out the door showing them houses because you knew that they were going to get a loan and they were probably going to buy very easily. Money was cheap. Credit was good. Everything was like that. Now, ro roll forward to 2009 or 2010 or currently in the market that you, we are in as this is being filmed, late 2023. And all of a sudden, it now changes. A buyer calls you and says, I want to buy a house. Before you even leave your office, you may say, what's your credit score? Have you been pre-approved? Do you have a full-time job or a full-time source of income? So it's not that you're not going to go show them houses. 
It's just the methodology by which you use to work that model. Like I said, prices will drop as supply goes up relative to demand. Keep demand the same, increase supply, prices drop. And conversely, the others the same. You keep the supply the same, raise the demand, and prices go up. Okay? This is the seller's market. That's the buyer's market. There are things that you will be guaranteed asked upon when dealing with a supply and demand on the exam. So things that will affect the supply of real property. I tend to look at this in my head as the creation of real estate, like new build homes. So as the cost goes up to build a home, what happens to the number of homes that get built? They go down, right? They go down because it now costs more to build that home. So less people build. These two are funny. Governmental controls and monetary policy. That's a real big fancy word for interest rate. As the interest rate goes up, what happens to the purchase of new homes? They go down. And like I said, they work opposite. As interest rates go down, what happens to the purchase of new homes? It goes up. So these are things that affect that supply curve. And I guarantee this will be a question on your exam. Now the opposite is true for things that affect demand. Think of the usage. As the population goes up, what happens to the demand for real property? It goes up as well. And my running joke that I tell everybody is there were more houses sold last year in Chicago, Illinois, than in Mohawk, Indiana. You guys know where Mohawk, Indiana is? My point exactly. Population 17 people. All right. So the more the population, the more demand for real property. Demographics is nothing but the study or the makeup of the population, which includes a whole bunch of other things like financial stability, uh, the movement of people, all of these. The third one being employment levels. As employment levels go up or the wage levels go up, what happens to the purchase of new property? They spend more money. If people have more money, they spend more money. So all three of these affect the demand. I will literally guarantee you right now, these are questions on both my exam and the state in which you're sitting in exam, because it is a common factor that you need to understand to help determine, are we in the buyer's market or in the seller's market? And are there going to be a lot of buyers going after one house? Or are there a lot of sellers going after one buyer? That affects the property, okay? <clears throat> there are some financial considerations to owning your own property. So this is the advantage to owning property. There are some deductions that you are going to get. You actually get deductions for your mortgage interest. So if you get a mortgage or your buyer gets a mortgage, there will be some deductions. Now, those deductions are being limited, as you can see, and it depends on the value of the home. If your home's over a million dollars, you may lose those deductions. If you've got a home over a million dollars, you may not need it, okay? The other benefit is on the sale of your property. Now, this is important, and once again, this isn't a question on the exam. So let's talk about this. And for the purpose of this course, we are going to use the term capital gains to mean profit. 
this is not an accounting course. We are not going to get into the minutia. So what I want you to see in this particular example, this simplistic example, is that capital gains is the money or the profit you make on the sale of your property. And those, the, the capital gains or the profit could be tax free, providing it meets two requirements. Okay, so here's the two requirements. If you are single and your capital gains is 250000 or less, you will not pay taxes on that. The first 250000 is tax-free if you are single. <clears throat> if you are married, It is the first five hundred thousand dollars. <throat> it's the only time in your life <laughs> your spouse is worth a quarter of a million dollars to you, <laughs> at least alive. <laughs> That's a joke. The second factor that has to be met is that you must have lived in the property for two out of the last five years. Those two years do not have to be consecutive. So you can live in a house for one year, rent it out for three years, live in the house the fifth year, that house would be considered owner-occupied because you have lived in it two out of the last five. Now, if you've lived in it the last two years, that would be two out of five, right? because the, you've already hit the two years. So let's go back and look at a couple examples. So let's say I bought a house for $150,000. I have lived in it for three years. I sold it, uh, let me <clears throat> make sure I'm doing this, for 450000 So in this example, and this is a very simplistic example, we are not going to get into depreciation and fees and all that. In this example, my capital gains was $300,000. Did I live in it two out of the last five years? Yes, I told you I lived in it three years. So that part has been met. I capital gains is 300 grand. But I am single in this example. So my first 250,000 is free. So let's go over here and say okay, so I made 300, but because I am single, I would only pay taxes on $50,000. Got it? Let's change the story for a minute. Let's say I was married. I now have a $500,000. I actually would pay taxes <clears throat> on $0 because I only made $300. I'm protected for the first $500. So I pay no taxes. So here's an example of the difference. You only pay the first 250 if you're single and the first 500 for married. And I lived there two out of five years because I've lived there three. So understand that owner occupied is two out of five years. That is the definition for the IRS. If I bought a property this year and I sold it later in the same year, did I live in it two out of five? No. Therefore, I would pay taxes on every bit that I make because I would not get the exemption for here because I didn't live in it two out of five. Okay? So these are some tax benefits that you actually get 
on owner-occupied property. So with that, we have now finished the introduction to real estate. What I would suggest is a couple different things. Right below us, we have got a quiz that will give you an insight into what the tests are going to look like. So go back and read your ebook, look at your notes, and take this quiz. If you have any questions, I encourage you to reach out to me. My email address is Raymond at realuniversity.com. And we can talk about your real estate questions. We can talk about real estate in general. I like to talk about real estate. So just reach out to me. All right. And this is the process by which we will do the remaining chapters in this course. I thank you and I look forward to seeing you in the next chapter.